During the 70s, Queensland matches against the Blues were often one-sided affairs. The Maroons not only battled for victory, but also battled for recognition from the national selectors. However, one player who battled through right to the top was Queensland and Australian skipper Greg Vivas. It's 10 years, Greg, since you were forced to give the game away. There's been some mighty changes since then, though. Tony, yeah, changes have happened, I guess, for the better of the game. Um, I think the state of origin uh, situation which came just after I give it away was uh, was really an innovation that uh, turned out to be a bonanza. And also now with the Broncos entry into Sydney, I think it's fantastic for the game and uh, certainly for the public. It was an eye injury that uh, forced your premature retirement. How is it now? Pretty good. I can still see enough to get into trouble. I, uh, I probably dropped about 25% of sight. Uh, on the second occasion, I done it a go. Originally, I done it in '75, and uh, I lost a bit. They said it would never occur again, but it came back in '79, uh, unfortunately. And uh, I guess uh, someone's got to give it away at some stage. Greg, that's not your only legacy from uh, the game of rugby league. Your voice is somewhat gravelly. What happened there? Uh, that's the legacy of running a few short arms, Dirk, out in England. I, uh, I was pretty young and uh, uh, not too bright, I guess. Uh, running with my head in the air and I was seeing Shorten over there. And it all started all those years ago with uh, Bow Desert. Mate, it did. Uh, Bow Desert was very good to me. I, uh, I started uh, rugby league down there in a side coach by uh, Sid Kelman, whom uh, I guess a lot of people would know. And uh, in that side, who, the captain of the side, uh, actually in those days, was uh, a, a fellow well-known to rugby league, a bloke by the name of Ian Douth. And uh, fortunately, we... Uh, we got together again in the side, I think it was 76 in Queensland side. But ironically, actually, uh, in those early days, Dowdy, Dowdy wasn't too uh, too often given the ball to kick goals. I used to be the goal kicker. <laughs> <laughs> Things changed after that. Yeah. Well, after your days in Bow Desert, uh, you went to South in Brisbane. Yes, I did. Uh, in a roundabout way, I couldn't get a start at East. And then I went to Brothers and I got the shunt from there. And uh, I finished at South, um, where I played all my, all my uh, senior football and uh, had a terrific relationship there with South and the players. Uh, it's been a great club to me and many other players that have gone through, yeah. You stayed pretty loyal to them, Greg. Uh, did Sydney ever beckon? Sydney did. I mean, I had a lot of lot of offers there uh, over my time, I guess, uh, from probably six or seven clubs. And, you, and you've done OK out of, uh, out of your life since you gave the football away? My life's been pretty good to me, you know. I never made a quit out of football, contrary to what everybody said, you know. Uh, I suppose... Uh, the most I ever picked up out of a game uh, uh, for a season was uh, was nearly 10, you know, and uh, things have changed now. They're probably 12-fold uh, that, aren't they? You know, uh, and that seems to be an average for top players. Well, Greg, you may not have made too much money out of rugby league when you played, but you certainly have uh, some great memories to treasure, and no doubt your greatest thrill must have been your selection as Australian captain for the World Cup in, in uh, 1978, I think it was. But again, that was shrouded with some kind of controversy. It seems to be the story of my life, Dago. Uh, controversy, yeah. I um, I wasn't aware at the time, but I believe that uh, what happens with the with the uh, selection uh, uh, committee, which uh, oftentimes I think of it now, and why do we have a selection committee? Because the selectors pick the side, and then it's got to go and be vetted by the board, and if the board don't like what they see, uh, apparently they change, and that's still the case today. Well, in, in my case... Uh, Apparently I was selected as captain, went to the board in Sydney and uh, Beetson's name wasn't mentioned in the side and uh, the board put Beetson back in and Arthur was captain and I was vice captain which is rather rare to see front row as captain and vice captain in any side, you normally have a back and a, and a, uh, and a forward but um, to Arthur's uh, to credit, you know, I mean I, I have nothing but the highest praise for Arthur and in fact, I used to think Arthur was probably the greatest footballer I've ever, I ever encountered in my term in the game. But Arthur found out that news and uh, uh, decided that uh, if he wasn't uh, the player to be selected, and Graham Olling was the player, then he should have been on the side. So that's how I finished up getting the Guernsey. Greg, even though you made seven appearances in the Australian jersey, you were never credited with a test. Is, is that disappointing? No, Tony. I, no, not really, because between 72 and 78, there were never any uh, any test matches. They were all World Cup. And uh, our peers, who, um, all those guys that played in there, our peers today uh, rate those games purely and simply as tests, and I think that can be uh, 
substantiated by the fact now that uh, Kangaroo reunions are, are equal to those who play World Cup or Tests, purely and simply because there are no Tests played in that area. You know. And the Australian team are coming onto the field and the crowd is ready and there are the two reserves, Dennis Fitzgerald and Mark Thomas of Queensland. There's the Australian team on the field. It's Edie number one, McMahon number two, Cronin three, Gartner four, Harris five, Peart six, Colt seven, Pierce eight, Higgs nine, Beetson and Captain ten, Randall eleven, Geiger twelve, Beavers thirteen, and as I said, Fitzgerald is in eighteen as the reserve, and Mark Thomas number sixteen, the other reserve. Geiger, Beetson, dummy back to Geiger, then gives it on to Beavers. is coming up and uh, I'm sure that a lot of people are interested in the performance of this young centre Mel Millinger. Okay, let's take a look at the Brisbane side now coming up for you and it comprises at fullback Dutton on the wings Backer and Eastwell in the centres Payne and Meninga. He's the centre with the very big rap on him, young Mel Meninga, goal kicking centre and 18 years of age they say he's destined for Sydney football. Wayne Carr 5'8", Wayne Lindenberg at halfback, Norm Carr at lock and then Des Morris, Greg Quinn. Greg Beaver's the captain, Johnny Lang and Bill Whitmore. So Johnny Lang coming up to take the tap. Beavers. Still with Beavers. Ridden to the ground by Ross Cale. Well, as you said earlier, Greg, you were pre-state of origin. How tough were New South Wales to beat uh, in your long run for Queensland? Yeah, they were pretty tough, I suppose. Uh, I suppose they were tougher uh, than what they are now, really because um, the Queensland makeup was basically uh, of subordinates. All the best players used to go over the border. And uh, I must say, to the credit of, uh, of all those players that I played with, uh, there was one, not one player that ever turned it up. And, uh, and there wouldn't again be one player that never played 150% of his ability in any of those games. I mean, they were really terrific games. And, and uh, as you say, pretty hard, but... Uh, Mate, I, they were really enjoyable, and the friendships that you've pulled out of that, and, you know, they just, you can't replace them. And that's the most important thing when gets out of like the league or sport of any nature, isn't it? You know? Had injury not intervened, Greg Vivers would almost certainly have been in that Queensland side for the historic first state of origin back in 1980. But he wasn't and has no regrets. Despite the struggles and the tough battles, the greatest game of all will remain one of his greatest memories.